Okay, great. Let's get going. Um, so my name is Nomsa and I am part of the marketing team here at the OR Society. Uh, today, we're lucky to be joined by Tom Stevenson, who is the head of customer success at Simulate. Uh, he'll be discussing how simulation has been used to test the long term and operational impact of policy ideas. Uh, so just before I pass things over to Tom, just want to run through a few things. Uh, so for anyone that's having any issues with accessing the webinar due to having a lockdown environment, um, they should have a link to Tom's slides, uh, which was sent with the final reminder, which uh, from GoToWebinar about an hour ago. Uh, for anyone with questions, uh, as Tom goes through his, uh, his presentation, Please do use the questions panel, uh, which is in on your right hand side, uh, where it says questions. And then uh, we uh, will pass over those questions to Tom to answer as we go along. Um, and final thing is that the slides and a recording of this webinar will be available after this webinar. So those will probably go out tomorrow, along with details of when our next webinar will be. So with all that being said, I'm just gonna pass things over to Tom. Tom? Thank you, Nomsa, and thanks to the OR Society for having me, and thanks to everybody who has joined. Um, just to give you a bit of a background about me, I'm the head of customer success at Simulate Corporation, uh, where I've worked for six years. Um, most of that time has been um, as a consultant, so building a lot of simulations, um, training clients and coaching clients in a lot of different sectors, really. Uh, so I've had a big focus on healthcare, manufacturing, back office, um, and I've done some policy work, importantly. Um, in terms of the OR Society, um, I've organized streams for some of the conferences. Um, I'm a member of the early career advice team. I've done a few talks um, kind of around the UK as well. Um, I'm going to be talking about why simulation is a useful technique to aid policy making decisions. And I'm going to give you some case studies as well um, to try and show that across a few different sectors and a few different countries as well. So I guess, first of all, we need to know what simulation is. Um, and there are a lot of definitions out there. Um, I tend to just go with an imitation of a system as it passes through time. So we're trying to emulate a system in a virtual environment. And once we've got a system in the virtual environment, that's really just the starting point because that then can be used as a test bed. Um, so if we've got that imitation of a system, we can test out lots of different ideas for change that we have and really see what the impact of change is likely to be, um, which is going to highlight if the change is going to work or if there are going to be any potential surprises um, as we make that change. So hopefully that's going to reduce any risk um, and it's going to help us make any decisions with evidence as well. So rather than just, um, you know, guessing what's going to work best, which we might often see, and uh, we can put some evidence and some numbers behind that. So I'm going to show you an example. I think that's the easiest way to kind of um, get across what we do. Um, I'm going to show an NHS example, which is really just to kind of show how a simulation might work for something like this. So imagine if the NHS is planning new services and which new services they should introduce to an area. Um, we might have our baseline set up, which is where people are just going to the normal services. And I've built a demonstration simulation that's just showing people going to the normal services over the year, the emergency department, uh, walk-in centers, urgent care centers, um, all hopefully um, services that you, you'd be familiar with in your local areas. So what we'd use do is we build the simulation to reflect all the arrivals that happen, how long people stay in the services, where queues are going to happen, um, and where there's going to be any interactions in the service. Um, with these types of simulations, often with policy, we want to start off looking long term first. So that's going to be things like how the population is going to change. Have we got a more elderly population, which is going to dictate how people are going to interact with services, and then we can move into the short term. So if I keep running this, what you'll see on the right hand side is 
Um, as the simulation runs, we'll collect results about how many people have used each service, um, or maybe the associated costs with that as well. Uh, there are a lot of results we can collect in a simulation that are gonna help us see if the change is gonna be effective. If I run this through quickly, I'm gonna fast forward it so we see some results. Um, and the idea is once you've built this and you're confident that it reflects your flow, whatever that flow may be, uh, you can test those changes. So in this case, if I say, let me build a community hub. Um, so this community hub here, show that. Um, so I built this community hub and the idea is that I think this is gonna stop some people going to the emergency department because they're gonna integrate with this hub. They might have like monthly appointments and it's gonna stop them having a more serious interaction with the healthcare service. So then I can run, run this through and it will be exactly the same, but now based on our assumptions, we'll see how people integrate with this new service and hopefully get some information about how it's likely to impact the real system. Again, I'll run this through quite quickly. And what you'll see is the costs might have gone down in certain areas, also the amount of interactions with the service might have gone down in certain areas but the amount of interactions in this area will have gone up. So we can look at how that's going to work based on our population. Um, and we can see what the impact's going to be. Um, so this can really apply to anything, um, anywhere where there's a flow of people or a flow of information, you can build up that flow and see the impact of change. So, I mean, why is this useful, especially in policy? Um, I guess, first of all, the thing that, or you know, the time that we're living in, there's so much data that's available. Uh, I've got an infographic up there, just with some numbers about what happens every minute of the day uh, with kind of technology companies. It's no different in policy. So whenever people are moving uh, into a justice system, social care, health care, um, anything where we might have to set government type policies we've got a lot of information about that um, and with the customers that we work with we often find that even though there's all this data available sometimes it can be difficult to interpret uh, often difficult to understand and that means you can't really use it effectively you can't really communicate ideas in an effective way if the data is just kind of sitting there in a repository so a lot of the time data might even be sitting unused because of that. Um, and I think what simulation allows you to do is use that data um, to manipulate it in a way that's gonna be understandable to people. So they can visualize the flow, they can see the movement of um, people through their system, and that's gonna help them understand the complexities. Um, it's gonna help them with communication of ideas um, and it's going to help them with engagement as well so i think particularly at this time in the in the world that we're living in um, with all this data that's why simulation can be really helpful uh, the other thing that is useful is that there's going to be so much variability um, we're going to have long-term variability and we're also gonna have short-term variability and you can quite accurately capture that within a simulation. So some of those things in the long-term on the right here, we might have seasonal elements. We're gonna have population growth and population change. Um, and we're gonna have a changing external environment as well. So, um, you know, new political ideas, um, change of the economy, um, social technology, all those changes are happening, uh, which we can include in the simulation. And then we can really drill down and see, well, how's that gonna impact individual services operationally? So how are they gonna perform at different hours of the week, um, different shifts? What if we have different opening hours, that kind of thing. So there are some case studies and I've got some case studies from a few different areas. Um, so I'm going to look at some healthcare uh, and social care. Um, you know, look at some justice um, simulations as well. We've got a lot of people around the world using simulation for justice. 
Um, there's some other ones that um, I've seen some use for, but um, I'm not going to talk about these too much. Uh, the people who we work with in defense, for example, can't really share too much of the simulations we build, um, but there are case studies out there that are useful. I want to look at smart cities as well, so I'm going to dive deeper into that because I feel like, although that's maybe not an area that Simulate as a company have um, been involved with um, so far, I've seen a lot of studies and a lot of different simulations being used effectively for that, um, so I think it's a good application for the future. So starting with healthcare, um, I thought it'd be useful to start with this because you can maybe link it to the, um, the demonstration that I just showed. So there's a lot of challenges that the government have in healthcare um, or that the NHS, especially in the UK and people all around the world are, are facing. So the, there's budget cuts, that means healthcare needs to adapt. Um, we often see people needing to keep patients away from that costly emergency care, so building new services. Um, population changes in healthcare are a big thing to consider as well, so people are living longer, um, but they're often living longer with long-term conditions, so those conditions that can't be treated, things like diabetes, um, and we have increased obesity as well, a um, big problem in the UK. I think in the US where I am right now, it's maybe a, an even bigger concern. Um, also, patient safety is a really big concern. So that means we have to follow really strict guidelines. Um, and those guidelines often need to be set nationally um, so that they're adhered to and patients remain safe. So one, one area that um, we've worked with um, in Northwest Surrey, we're looking at um, a low capacity hub that supported older people. Um, so for that, in the long term, we need to know what the demand for the service is going to be. So we need to know how many people in this age group are likely to be in the area and how that's going to maybe change over the next five to 10 years. Um, that's going to help us know what capacity is required and it's going to help us see the impact on different services. So this model was built in Scenario Generator. Um, it is a simulate toolkit designed specifically for healthcare pathways. Uh, so simulate being the, the tool that um, can be used to model any pathway scenario generator, being a tool that is used specifically for healthcare pathways. Um, but you'll see here what we started with is by looking at how the population is likely to change. And this red area here is the um, 75 to 84s, which should remain really, relatively consistent based on local projections. But the total 85 plus C is going to go up very, very high. And often those people who are older are going to need more care. So we factored all of this into the long term. We built some pathways looking at how that flow occurs. Um, and then we look at, well, what's going to happen if we introduce a new service? So in this case, we said, well, we need to have three visits over three days um, and we need to have a lot of follow ups as well. Uh, we need to staff the service appropriately. And we think this is going to take some care away from a lot of other services. Um, so we need to make those estimates. Now, what you can see is by building a simulation, you can kind of test what it's going to be. So these uh, these results are showing for different services how the baseline would look if we didn't make the change, how um, it's, the simulation is showing it will look and what's predicted locally. So you can see in some areas there's a bit of a gap between what's predicted locally um, compared to what the simulation is actually predicting. Um, so it's going to help with decision making and certainty around how you should change a service. Um, and then you would drill down into the short term and say, well, if we have this many attendees, how many staff do we need to be appropriately utilized? So this is a really good example of how a kind of uh, local academic health science network has um, used this. Uh, but a lot of the work that we actually did was with NHS England initially. So we've been working with NHS England for a few years now looking 
at this on a national scale. So how can you change services um, and how is that going to impact different areas? So this is an example from Canada um, along the same line. So we're, here we are looking at uninsured um, people. So particularly for maternity flows, there's a lot of um, people that Mount Sinai Hospital in Canada um, need to work with for prenatal services. And what we were finding was that those people who don't have insurance often didn't use prenatal services um, because they're quite costly. But the problem was the hospital was then having to treat women um, often coming in through the emergency room um, and having long lengths of stays if they didn't receive these services. So the hospital kind of felt that um, it was actually more of a burden for them if those uninsured women didn't use the services. So essentially they needed evidence to kind of test that that is actually true. Um, so what they did is they tested to see well what would happen if you could um, give uninsured women prenatal services and see what the impact is on care going forward over the next few years. Um, and this, you, by using a simulation, it was enough to kind of create an evidence, enough evidence to support the, the initiative. Other things in healthcare as well that you might use policy for um, and simulation in policy, the four hour wait at A&E. Um, or four hours to be treated in A&E. And also uh, nice guidelines are often informed by simulation as well. So um, these are the National Institute of Clinical Excellence guidelines, and these are the national kind of policies around how uh, patients need to be treated that all hospitals should adhere to. Um, but before these guidelines need to are kind of released to the public, they need to be tested very thoroughly. Um, and there's a few times where Simulate has certainly been used as a tool for that, but also a lot of the other simulation techniques are used frequently um, to test the how you might treat patients in different areas of healthcare. So uh, the next kind of area that I wanted to look at is social care and some of the examples of work there. Um, and the common challenges that I often see here are a changing environment. So we've got increased digitization, um, so that means that you, a lot of times in social care, people are very used to writing um, a lot of information down, having information not really in a system. So, for example, um, we've done a lot of work in child health and there's a kind of little book where all the child health records have been going into. Um, and there's now a movement to make that digital, uh, which is great, but we don't know what the impact is likely to be. Um, We've got a lot of geographic mobility as well. Uh, people are moving around a lot. Um, I've worked on projects, especially near, let's say, Heathrow Airport, where we can see that the amount of inwards migration um, and population change is, is massive. And especially in areas in the UK like London, we see a lot of geographic mobility causing big changes in how social care needs to work. Probably one of the biggest challenges remains an aging population in social care as well. So um, another op uh, case to do, this was from uh, Canada as well, actually. Um, and this was um, a project that used simulation to look at the um, outcomes for children and youth um, using mental health services. And this is one that looked at changing the workforce using digital um, digital methods as well. You could see how aligning services and using that kind of standardized approach, um, how that's gonna affect efficiencies in this area. So a simulation was built. Um, we didn't build this, this was built by the Pepler Group actually alongside NHS England. Um, and we built, the simulation, we looked at what the results are for the baseline and also for the change of scenario. And the key thing was that there was a lot of solutions that could be tested. Um, so we could test a lot of different solutions and we could quantify the impact. Um, and there was efficiency gains, but that also directly linked 
to a monetary gain in this situation. Another one um, not built by Simulate um, was about homeless services. So this is in New York now in the US and um, they use simulation because everybody in New York essentially has a right to shelter if they're homeless. Um, but there's a changing environment. There's a lot of seasonality uh, that needs to be taken in, into account in the long term. Um, and there's a lot of population change as well that needs to be taken into account in the long term for planning. Um, but really, this simulation was built to test that capacity to make sure that even when the seasonal variation occurs, um, you can still hit that service level agreement of everybody having their right to shelter. Um, so that's um, another social care use. We're going to move on to justice now. Um, and justice is quite a complex area, it's a complicated system, uh, much like healthcare, much like social care you've got a lot of different elements that are working together. So you've got 911 calls coming in or 999 calls coming in. Um, you've got court cases. You've got um, prison sentencing and parole. Uh, you've got a lot of different initiatives that are all kind of working together in one complex system that could be very difficult to understand. Um, and it's an area where there's a lot of information that hopefully simulation can help illuminate the um, the need for change and um, show what the, the quantifiable benefits of change will be. Uh, so an example of this was applied research services who used simulation to look at their prison populations. This was another US study based in Texas. Um, and they used simulation for a lot of different tests, really. And they looked at the long term impact um, of policy and budgetary decisions and then drill down into the short term as well. So things like release policies, like when prisoners should be released, um, how rehabilitation should work, um, what if um, changing sentencing occurs as well. Um, and in the short term, you've got things like jail booking, um, inmate pickup and delivery and prison classifications. So we can simulate all of this in the virtual environment and test what that change is going to be. So let's take an example of this. Um, if we have like the change of sentencing, if sentencing is increased, then that's going to increase the amount of time that people need to spend in jail, which is going to mean there's going to be less slots available for people in jail, um, which it might mean that alternative solutions need to be tested. And applied research services use this technique a lot to answer all of those different questions. Um, in New Jersey, quite close by, um, they were looking at their bed bases for populations with mental health concerns using simulation. And the problem is they already had a real big backlog of people waiting for mental health beds. Um, but the problem from a government perspective is that that particular uh, sector of the population, if they aren't placed properly, are very likely to commit crimes or um, cause kind of social unrest, really. Um, so they needed to use simulation to know how many um, different beds would they need, not only to handle the changing populations and the, the, um, the growing need for beds, but also to handle the backlog that they already were experiencing. So finally, um, I'm going to look at smart cities. And I've got some um, kind of academic studies to look at here. So I think it's really interesting um, topic to look at. So some of the common challenges we've got, um, poor building placement can lead to traffic jams. And you might have clusters of people looking to move the same way. Um, you'll see it in a lot of the big built up cities, traffic jams are um, causing a lot of problems um, in that whole system as well. Emergency vehicles need to be quick and um, we've got a lot of technology moving forward. So things like self-driving cars, um, very exciting technology to have, but there's still quite a lot of unknowns in that area. 
um, of which we can help to really find out what the impact is going to be by building these simulations. And there is a drive to reduce carbon footprint as well. Um, so actually, within Simulate, we've got a feature that allows you to track carbon footprint. Um, but these are all things around smart cities that people would be looking to test in simulation. I've got a case study here um, looking at an intersection. So where uh, you've got four different routes of traffic meeting um, and how these delays are going to occur. So this was tested using, well, what is the standard standard methodology? Um, and then what would happen if you could use intelligence in there? So different types of coding on the traffic light -like system um, and see how that's going to work based on where the traffic lies and the communication between all that different traffic. Um, and you could see from a simulation that there was such a big um, benefit to having that intelligent intersection. So, for example, delays reduced by 85%, fuel consumption by 50%, and emissions by 39 to 50%. So, I think by using simulations to test something like this, even if you're not 100% convinced that these figures are going to be correct, it's enough of an improvement to certainly justify making the change and that's really the key with simulation is having enough evidence to justify the change that you intend to make so the second um, study on the same lines is a novel smart parking testing so they used a mixed integer linear program in simulation for this one and this was all about reserving optimal parking spaces based on how close the area you need to be and the cost you need to incur and it was like Whenever you are near a space looking for a car parking spot, it can reserve that spot for you uh, intelligently by sharing that data. Um, and you can see a significant cost and time reduction is achieved by that. Um, there's a lot of other things that are happening with smart cities as well. Like um, many of you will have seen how emergency vehicles can control traffic lights and things like that. All of this can be tested in simulations uh, to see the positive impact. Um, but this is my last case study that I wanted to talk through just now. There are a lot more case studies that I have on a lot of different areas. So um, more than happy for anybody to follow up with me after the webinar as well. Um, but if you have any questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to take them now. Brilliant. Uh, so we have the first question from Ian Mitchell asking, can simulations become useful for ways for organizations to understand their places as components of biggest, a big, for the bigger system and so find compromises that are good for all rather than brilliant for a few and dire for the rest? Did you get all that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so um, I think that's, that's a... Um, a good question and it's one where um we have seen use simulation quite a lot because what you what you have is you have this whole system that you can look at the links between the services so if i take healthcare as an example imagine if the emergency department is really really full what you're going to have is you're going to have an impact if people are going to try and come into that emergency department they're going to see that there's too big a line and then they're going to look for alternative care or it can work the other way around like if the gp is closed early then there's no alternative people accept to go to the emergency department so you can look at all those links between the different services and you can see how that's likely to um how they're likely to work together um and when you build in that assumption what you want to do is isolate those results of the areas where that thing has happened, where people have maybe had to use an alternative service in a in an area because uh, a separate one wasn't maybe appropriate. Um, so finding that balance is often quite tricky and um, it's certainly an area of simulation uh, where simulation can be useful. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. And we have another question or another couple of questions, actually. Uh, yep. The first one is from uh, 
Jayan Hirani, who asks, have you dealt with difficult policy colleagues in the past and how do you convince them of the usefulness of simulation? Um, I think anyway, you can have difficult, um, difficult colleagues or, or I think it's more people who will have their set ideas. So you, you'll often have people who have worked in a service a long time um, and they'll have their way of working um, or they might not really uh, be very open to change um, or just very certain that their their methodology is likely to work. Um, that's probably where I've seen had most struggle with people. Um, and I think that's where you have to make sure that the simulation is very easy to understand. So you have to make sure that it's very visual, um, that the results of it are very clear, um, so that it helps communicate those ideas in a way that's going to allow people to understand this. The other, the other thing that I always make sure I do whenever I, I feel like it's going to be difficult um, for people to maybe accept the assumptions of a simulation is always involve them all the way through the simulation build. So you don't want to build a simulation show the people who you're working with the results at the end you want to be including them the whole way through so collecting input data from them getting them to test the simulation at various points of development and maybe run workshops as the simulation's been built as well i think that's the best way to mitigate against having those um and all good colleagues Brilliant. Great. Thank you. Uh, I've got another question from Chris Allen, which is probably a little bit tied to that last question. But Chris says, uh, senior stakeholders I work with as an internal consultant often get very excited about simulation when they first encounter it, but can have very unrealistic expectations. Any yeah. tips on how to manage those expectations without undermining their faith in simulation as an approach? Yeah, it's a tricky one because I, I see it a lot of times where you'll have a simulation. It is exciting for people to see that simulation and it does spark new ideas and new things that you want to build into the simulation, which is great because it shows interest and it, it shows that people are becoming engaged with the simulation. But often it might not be so feasible, it might be difficult. Um, what I always do um as a consultant is make sure that i've got a really clear specification of the initial model um so real really clear there's kind of a three-step um methodology that i go through one what is the problem um so what problem am i trying to solve with this simulation that's the main one because if you are saying what problem you're trying to solve that prevents a lot of scope creep then you say well if this is my problem, how can I possibly solve it? So what are the possible techniques that I might use to solve it? What changes could I make? Um, for example, in a prison system, could I look at having increased um, tags on people? Um, could I look at reducing uh, young offending and having schemes early on? You. You want to have those ideas for change ready before you start building the simulation. Um, and then to make those changes, finally, you want to know, well, what strings can I pull um, to make those changes? Uh, what things can I possibly do? Um, and I think you want to keep reminding people. Once you've got that sorted at the start of the project, you want to remind people as you're doing the presentation, this is my problem. Um, these are my ideas for trying to solve the problem. And these are the results. Um, there's nothing wrong with that moving on to a phase two, but I think you just have to keep people very clear about what problem you're trying to solve as you, as you do any present presentations. Great, uh, thank you for those tips. And uh, I've got another question from Andreas uh, Giorgio, who asks, in your opinion, which approach seems to fit better for long-term policy testing, especially in a social care setting? Discrete event simulation or system dynamics? Versus, uh, this is based on your case studies. Yeah, um, I mean, with me being kind of a um, 
specializing in discrete event simulation. I apologize for any bias that may come up in this answer. Um, but I think both of them have a place. Um, so system dynamics is great for looking at that big picture and, and getting a really quick result because you can look at things like population change um, really quickly. Um, if you need to know any kind of detail, that's where discrete event comes in more use. So say if I'm making this change, I want to know how many people are going to use the services, then um, it's good to use system dynamics. If you want to know, well, what what is that going to mean for my staff staffing or how are waiting times going to change based on this? That's where um, discrete event is useful. I mean, I'm lucky enough to have actually collaborated on a project um, where we use both discrete event and system dynamics, and you can use them both together. I'll be happy to share that study. I actually um, presented that at the Winter Simulation Conference a couple of years ago, a hybrid method. Um, but I think it depends a lot on the problem you're trying to solve. If you want that really high level um, answer, although you can do it in discrete event simulation, both options are, are very good. If you're going to want to drill down, that's where you, um, you're then going to want to use discrete event simulation. And there's, if you have access to both of them, it can be useful to, to use both methodologies. Um, I, I tend to manage both of them just using discrete event simulation. So even if I'm looking at the whole system and just looking at high level changes, I would often do that with discrete event simulation um, so that it can feed into the lower level detail um, seamlessly. But both, both are good potential options. It depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Brilliant. Thank you for that, uh, Tom. And thank you, Andreas, for the question. Uh, do we have any more questions uh, before we? OK, yes. So we have uh, another one from Ian Mitchell. Yep. And he says that Professor Pat Rivett describes simulations as a way of playing it through for situations too expensive or lethal or both to deal with in the real life. Would you agree? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, as I said, it is that that way of testing. Often, especially with policy, we're, we're dealing with people. So we um, there's a lot of risk if things go wrong that those people are going to be um, impacted uh, in a negative way. So having that test bed to kind of give more confidence that changes are actually going to be positive, I think, is a really powerful thing. And it's certainly something that I think simulation is useful for. I always try to build simulations in a way that enable very quick testing of different scenarios, um, because that's the main point, I think. It's not about building the model. Um, it's about being able to answer that question and I've been able to answer that question quite quickly. Um, so yeah, I think I completely agree with that statement. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, do we have any more final questions before we finish off? And uh, whilst people uh, think about if they have any additional questions, Tom, uh, what is the best way for people to get in touch with you if they wanted to know a little bit more about some of the work you've done already and, and accessing some of those case studies that you've mentioned? Yeah, I think, um, well, there's a lot of different ways. Um, do you, are you able to share my email address with the, with the yeah. old delegates? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I'm happy to take any kind of questions. Um, I'll, you, you all have my email address. Um, I'm on LinkedIn as well, so do feel free to connect with me on there. That'll be Tom Stevenson Simulate. I'm sure you can find me by typing that into Google. Um, or if you're at any, um, I'm often at quite a lot of OR Society uh, meetings as well. So um, if you catch me at any of those, do come and have a chat. Brilliant, thank you so much. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions for now. So thank you again, uh, Tom, for that wonderful presentation. Lots of uh, interesting insights there. And to the audience, thank you again for joining us for another webinar. And apology for some of those uh, 
audio drop-offs, but we will be sending this round uh, tomorrow uh, as a recording, as well as those slides, along with Tom's uh, details as he's just given us now. So thank you once again, and um, see you for the next one.